Hello, everybody. This is Jacob Stoops, and you are listening to episode 56 of the Page 2 podcast. And if you do not know who I am, I am a senior SEO manager at Search Discovery. Uh, and I am joined by my co host, some call him the Al Borland of the Page Two podcast <laughs> or the SEO world. <laughs> Hey, howdy, hey. There it is. There it is. That's your new thing. You just have to do yes. that every every week now. Hey, howdy, hey. That's, uh, That's... Jeff's uh, intro. I think it was also Woody's from Toy Story 2 or 3 or 4. Or You're right. There. My kids love that. Love that movie. You're, uh, uh, I guess if we were a talk show, I would be Conan and you would be Andy Richter? Or do you want to be Conan? No, I, I'm not that tall, so. Yeah, you're right. Conan is. I'm more built like Andy, so. <laughs> All right. So we are joined today. Oh, oh by the way, uh, Jeff, if you don't know, and this is this is me messing up the intro yet again. There are so many yeah. other SEO podcasts that do their intro way better, and ours is just a hot mess pretty much every time. But oh. Jeff is a technical SEO at the New York Times wire cutter division. It just makes our podcast, you know, more unique than everyone else. Do it. Let's bring yeah, in our got, guests. So we have a uh, very they're polished and they have week. things. Uh, like they're polished. Polished. They've polished. got really uh, nice radio voices. Uh, yeah, exactly. Managing and they've got their intros down pat. Whereas the only thing that we've got no, down well, pat every you. week is that Jeff oh, is going to say, hey, 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 and I'm going to stumble my way through until we finally introduce. I love it. And this is joining us from across the pond. So we are going back across the pond for another guest. And it is always great to talk to somebody uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I hope I, I hope I sounded completely awful, <laughs> awful while saying while saying that. Um, but yes, no, it's it's two thirty for her, so she just has to bear uh, an an hour or so of talking to us, and she's off for her weekend because we record on Fridays, and for us, it's the morning uh, morning time. So we've got an entire day uh, ahead of us. Anyhow, uh, so Helen, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, for those people that are new listeners, uh, let me explain the podcast a little bit because it's a little bit different than most SEO podcasts. So the core of this podcast, uh, quite honestly, is not necessarily the knowledge sharing angle. We do get to that, but it's not the focus. Uh, when we started this podcast, we wanted to be a little bit different. Uh, and part of being different is just taking a, a different approach and having a different slant to talking about the SEO industry. And the way that we do that is we focus on the people behind the SEO. Uh, we talk about where they come from, their origin stories, and quite honestly, uh, what is it actually like to be an SEO? What are the big challenges? What are the trials and tribulations that we go through? Because we all go through them. So if you're listening to this, uh, you're going to hear a bit of knowledge dropping because uh, we do have a lot of experience and that's great. But the focus is on telling the telling the quote unquote war stories uh, and what it's like to kind of be in the trenches every day uh, as an SEO. And part of that is to let you know as a listener, uh, if you're going through something, you're not alone. Uh, there are other people out there that are just like you. Anyways, uh, before we get into Helen's background, uh, and I want to make sure that we spend a lot of time on that. One thing that we started doing last week uh, was our show's first live read. Uh, in that live read, we're going to do it again, and we're just going to keep doing it because we believe that uh, this organization, uh, which is uh, United Search, is something that uh, we want to support. So here it goes. And you guys uh, grade me. Tell me if I, uh, and Jeff's, uh, I, Helen, I don't know if you listened to the episode last week, but Jeff, you had no yeah. choice but to listen to the episode. So tell me if I'm getting a little bit better at these live, live reads. All right. All right. So are you looking to break into SEO conference speaking, but not sure how? Are you feeling that you are not well represented within the current SEO speaking circuit and want to change that? Well, we at the Page Two Podcast would like to take the opportunity to let users know about United Search, a new organization and first of its kind SEO speaker accelerator dedicated to ending the implicit bias in SEO that keeps BIPOC, LG, 
LBGTQIA+, and women in the margins of our industry. Their credo, diverse SEO equals better SEO. United Search offers mentoring advice from people with real world practical SEO experiences in order to give students the skills they need to be able to deliver an amazing presentation on any stage and the network they need to land gigs all at no cost to the student. So how does this work? Uh, it's actually pretty simple. United Search connects a cohort of best of the best pitches they can source with the top mentors in their subject matter. After working with their mentors to develop their talk, they will host a live stream event where students get to present to SEO experts and receive positive, constructive feedback. Graduates of this SEO accelerator will get the benefit of top-notch mentorship, public speaking training, a video reel, lots of positive feedback, as well as a foot in the door to help find and land speaking gigs and access to an amazing community of SEO professionals. What does this mean for our podcast? As a sponsor and advocate, we're committed to regularly showing stats that illustrate our commitment to diversity on this podcast. And, we made, and we've made a pledge to diversify, meaning that 60% of our guests will come from underrepresented, underrepresented groups, including women, BIPOC, BAME, LGTBQIA+, as well as representation for people with disabilities and those who are 55 and older. If this sounds of interest to you, Visit unitedsearch.org to learn more about becoming a student or mentor and visit them on or visit them on Twitter at search underscore united. Sounded great. Oh, sounded yeah. like you're actually a podcast advert. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Turning into a radio guy before before our very eyes. All right. I'm gonna quit SEO and 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 uh, become a radio radio host. <laughs> I just have to stop tripping over my words every three paragraphs. All right, so All right. let's get into the episode. So Helen, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. A little bit about me? I thought this whole episode was about me. Uh, tell, oh. the, tell them a lot about yourself. A lot, no, this is really <laughs> From the beginning. no way interesting enough to warrant the entire episode. Um, a little bit about me. So I've been in the industry for maybe a couple of millennia. It's kind of hard to remember now. Uh, it feels like a very long time, at least... Uh, I think about 12 years now. Um, I started off life more as a generalist marketer, specialized into digital and then into SEO. Um, and next I'm probably gonna be, I don't know, a peach farmer, I've not decided yet. Uh, but yes, I've been in the industry for quite a while now, um, specializing really in um, website migrations, a lot of uh, analytics and uh, kind of SEO strategy. Do they grow a lot of peaches in the UK? I mean, they might do soon. I have no yeah. idea. It's probably a terrible. Time for me, no, you know it's funny. I live in in Georgia, um, in the United States, and our everything is peach down here, but yet we don't grow peaches. Huh. It used to be like the peach capital back in the 1700s, but now uh, they grow peaches like in Florida and other places. But uh, everything around us, we're the peach state. Everything about us is peaches. So if you want to come, you can revive the peach market here in uh, Georgia. Okay, so I'd like to put forward a motion for the rest of this episode to be solely on the subject of peach farming. All right. <laughs> or the Rock, the Rockford Peaches, one of my favorite movies, A League of Their Own. Oh, there you go. That's the only that's the only peach reference that I have. By the way. So, <laughs> well done. Well done. The, the episode's now over. Um, so, I guess he Helen, that was actually the quick version and not the not the long version. So, take us back a little bit further. Um, where are you from? <laughs> Uh, so I was born and raised in Kent, which is in the southeast of England. Uh, not yet escaped. Um, I've been here quite a while now. Um, yes, and I, I left school at the age of 18 and decided not to go to university, which was kind of the, the done thing amongst all of my peers, really. So I went the other route and decided to get into the world of work. And that's how I eventually ended up in marketing. And I guess what made you what made you decide to, to, to leave school and go straight to work? It was a combination of not really having a definitive idea of what I wanted to do when I was that age. I mean, initially, I actually wanted to train as a counsellor, so a, a therapist. Um, and so at the age of 18, I managed to manage to just about get onto a course that was willing to train me in counselling. You don't normally go into it at such a young age. So I had a lot of uh, uh, colleges actually just turn me down and say, you have to wait until you've got more life experience. So I started off in that route. So rather than going to university, I actually... Um, 
went on a, a, a course that allowed me to train as a counsellor. Um, but after a year, I realised that I wasn't actually going to be able to progress with that because I was just too young to get a placement. Um, and you have to get a placement in order to qualify. So I had to kind of put those dreams on hold um, and decided just to go into the world of work and just kind of figure out from there what I wanted to do. And uh, through a couple of administration jobs, that I actually did quite a lot of marketing for. I thought, actually, you know what, well, this is this is kind of what I want to be doing. I really enjoy the creativity of marketing. So I'm going to actually focus on this for my career and get some qualifications in it. So, you know, I think back to when I was 18 and Jeff, tell, I mean, tell me about the, the stone age when you were, when you were 18 yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> I mean, who really knows what they want to do? I, I feel like guidance counselors must have the, easiest job when they're in maybe they don't but it just seems like it's like it would be easy because you're dealing with a bunch of kids who literally have no idea what they want to do or what they want to be and is as long as you get them get them out of school point they could be pointed in literally any direction uh as long as that direction is is not jail and you're 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 doing your you're doing your job um but i know for myself uh i thought i knew what i wanted to be when I was when I was young, and then life experience just sort of kind of takes over. I also went into into the world of work uh, primarily uh, to pay for school because you know I guess the the quote unquote normal thing to do is you get done with high school and you go to college. Well, what happens when you go to college and you've got literally no no clue what you want to do with your life. And, and uh, you know, that was definitely, definitely me. I thought I knew what I wanted to do. And it turns out that I literally, literally had no idea. Um, and I started to become a graphic designer. And quite honestly, that didn't work out. And I fell into SEO, which is kind of what it seems like most people do in this industry where like you just, you start somewhere else and you, and you end here and it's, yep. it's crazy, crazy. No, I, I had a similar path. So I never graduated from university either. I, um, out of high school, no clue what I wanted to do. Um, my father wanted me to, he wanted me to go to college. So he, we, we settled on a community college. I went for one semester, dropped out. I hated it. Started working on roofs and doing things like this, like as someone who wasn't going to university would do, and I hated that even more. <laughs> so, so it's hard work. Yeah, so I went back to you know the community college, and and I had you know a dream of you know being on the radio. Started doing some radio and television. Um, realized I'm not very good at that stuff, and some of my classes were in the communication side and with with um, with that. So I've really like started twiddling around with things. And then I, I had an HTML class when like H, when the web was very, very young <laughs> and just loved it. And from there, it just kind of like grew, like I again, dropped back out. But at that point I was just full fledged, like web developer, designer, everything back in 1995, what you could be. Um, all, I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. I just had Photoshop and was on a rampage. So <laughs> um, and that turned into SEO somehow <laughs> after after all these years. So did, you know, and, and not even planning because it's, I'm still at the point where like, what do I want to do when I grow up? And um, this was just kind of happened to be, it's weird how your passions take you to certain areas. And, and I do have a passion of just digging into things and um, whether it's taking apart uh, you know, a stereo and trying to put it back together or taking apart a website and putting it back together better. It's, it's kind of, to me, some of the same stuff. So, so Helen, so, okay. So you get into digital, digital marketing and you enjoy the, the creativity. So in your kind of early formative working years, um, I guess talk about some of the stuff that you were that you were doing and how that kind of led you down the trail of becoming not just an SEO but a technical SEO. I mean, I use the term technical SEO very lightly because I've met actual technical SEOs and they are a league above anything I could ever aspire to be. Um, so I do need to just make that confession. Um, but I think essentially, I I started off really being the young person in the organisation. And because of that, I was the one tasked with doing things with the website, uh, whereas whether that was kind of uploading things to the website or just uh, making sure the website was still running, that kind of stuff. And 
through that, I really kind of got a passion for that digital element um, of marketing. So I had some very, very terrible campaigns that I ran right at the beginning when um, thankfully no one was really paying attention, um, including some very, very shoddy uh, PPC adverts and some terrible, terrible attempts at keyword research. Um, one slightly humiliating thing that I probably shouldn't admit to is um, before I knew what keyword research even was or even really what SEO was, uh, I was trying to figure out how people were finding the website for the company that I was working for. And we had a an email newsletter that we sent out every week. So I was allowed to design something to go in the email newsletter that asked people how they searched for our company and came across our company. That was my great keyword research strategy, asking people. And that's what I did. And so they had a prize that essentially I think they would win an iPad or something if uh, someone answered this question of how they would have searched for our particular company. Um, and so the company ended up having to give away an iPad for someone saying, oh, I just searched for your brand name. That was it. That was my keyword <laughs> research strategy. It's humiliating to think about it now. Um, I have come slightly further from there, I have to say. It's probably not how I would do that keyword research now, but um, yeah, it's where I started. You know, it's, it's, it's funny, but a long time ago, that's how things were done. Like I worked at a company where when we wanted to know how someone would click on a website, we like paid 20 people to come in and watch them scroll down on our website. Like we didn't have mm -hmm. AB testing. We didn't have analytics. Um, and, and I remember um, the, like the planning team on the design team would come in and have like 50 pictures on a table and would literally bring in a hundred people and say, if you think of Colgate toothpaste, which one of these images do you think goes best with it? And that's how they picked what the header of the website would be. Mm -hmm. um, so you weren't far off. <laughs> it was it was very <laughs> early on. It's how they, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's at the time, it's like, how do you, you get to us? And, and that's, um, you know, just knowing what people would say. And, and in a way, that's a very small form of keyword research, but it does, you know, get you going, right? So Yes. And um, thankfully, I'd no longer have to give away an iPad every time I'm trying to do keyword research. So. Yeah. That would be a little tough. bit cheaper. That's uh, that's funny, and it is it is absolutely okay to ad admit to uh, to being ter <laughs> terrible <laughs> at something early early on in your career because you were you didn't know any better you were just uh, just learning, uh, yeah totally totally normal. Uh, I feel like there are when I think back to my early career, I don't know if I've ever. I can't remember if I've told this story or not, but I early in my career started um, started a blog and the the name of the blog was Agent SEO, which is the, just the worst moniker possibly ever. Uh, and it was uh, related to the movie, the I think the Matrix and the Born Identity were movies that I was watching at the time. So I thought it was really, really a cool name and it's really, 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 really stupid. But anyways... I was in no position to be blogging and not just blogging, but telling, giving people advice with my limited, like six months to one year of, of experience in, in SEO. But I would say that because of doing that, that kind of led me to, uh, I think, uh, you know, a passion for the, um, for the work. And it had the good result of uh, allowing me to learn things through tinkering on my website. So there was a, there was a side, side benefit. Um, okay. So you have, uh, you know, you, you're fresh off of, off of the heels of costing your company and an iPad and running, run, run the, uh, the, the PPC campaigns. And at what point did you switch and say like, okay, it, SEO is really where it's at. That's what I, that's what I want to be. It was probably at my next job, actually, where I was really focusing on marketing solely. Um, mm -hmm. And I was I was working sort of offline and online. I definitely knew it was online marketing I wanted to focus on. Um, and I was, again, given the, um, the remit to just do things with a website that makes the website better. So that's when I really started researching, well, how do you make your website better? How do you mm -hmm. get visibility online? How do you make your brand known because it wasn't a well-known brand and I wanted to change that and that's kind of how I fell into well actually SEO is a thing and I want to give it a go so I wasn't um no one was paying attention again to what I was doing so it gave me a lot of free reign to experiment with things um I uh, found out that keyword density was a thing so I came up with my own keyword density formula calculation which I was incredibly proud of <laughs> 
just to find out the keyword density wasn't really a thing anymore and the formula was useless so that was sad but it was at that point that I kind of thought actually this is a really technical subject and I, I really mm. enjoy that I'm very analytical I'm very technical in how I approach things but also enjoy the creativity that marketing brings and SEO kind of covers all of that mm -hmm. um, and it's such a wide uh, skill set that I thought well at worst I'm going to learn a lot about a lot of things and at best I could actually find a career that I'm really interested in so it was kind of there that I started really paying attention to the actual website and website performance and visibility aspect of marketing kind of ignored all the offline stuff that I didn't really want to focus on anymore and that was kind of the direction I went um, and from there I was able to go to an agency that specialized in digital and the rest is kind of SEO focused from there. And let me ask you this, when you, so you've spent a fair amount of time in agencies and you've even founded your, your own agency. Um, when you finally, so it, this was my experience, right? Or maybe I won't tee up my experience. I want to let you, you answer. So when you went from working at places where it was like, just make sure our website is up and running to going to an agency with other like-minded people, kind of what was that? feeling like for you? Because I know what it was like for me, but I'm always interested to, to learn what, what it was like for other people. It was, it was really eye-opening. I remember uh, quite early on when I started at the first agency that I worked at, um, people kept referring to the back end of the website. I was like, why do you keep calling it? It's a CMS. You're using a content management system. Why do you keep saying the back end? I don't understand what you're talking about. And everyone in the company, this massive agency, kept talking about the back end. And I was like, this is weird stop using this terminology it's not correct and um, I had it was that point I realized that I had trained myself in a certain way of doing things a certain way of understanding things that wasn't necessarily industry-wide and I've been quite isolated at that point of time so it was a kind of a, a process of relearning some things and I think every company that I've gone to since then it has been a process of relearning things because I think when you're in agency although you are amongst a lot of other people who are potentially specialists and you're working with a lot of different clients, you fall into a way of doing things. And sometimes you need that experience of going somewhere else or having some external input to stop you just doing things because that's how it's done in your agency and actually thinking more creatively about a problem. Um, so that was my first real experience of agency was just going to this place where everyone else spoke a different language to me essentially. And I had to kind of catch up really quickly. And then I guess, what are some of the challenges of um, agency life as you kind of, you know, you, you, you got in there, you got more settled in, you made your adjustments and then you're, then you're in what I just like to call a agency world, right? It's just a, it's like a whole other type of existence within, within SEO. It's much different than, uh, than in-house. It's much different than being a, a consultant. It comes with much different challenges. Uh, so, as you settled in, uh, what were some of the challenges that you went through? I think in all of the agencies that I've worked in, there's always been a very common struggle, and that is managing so many different stakeholders, both internally and externally. So you have a wide range of clients that you're answerable to, but you also have various different teams that kind of get in between you and the client. So there might be an account management team that you're answerable to. You might also have a... Um, a department lead that you're answerable to and they might all want different things um, they are all potentially trying to work towards success for the client but that's not always what happens and so you're constantly kind of juggling priorities and making sure that you are kind of um, meeting the needs of all of these different people that isn't always aligned I think when you're in-house when you're working in a brand there's just that little bit more alignment between each of the teams each of the departments because there'll be one or two core goals that you're moving towards as a business. But when you're working in agency, you've got the core goals of the client, but you also have core goals of revenue and efficiency and time recording and all that kind of stuff that goes alongside it. So a lot of your time when you're working in agency is actually focusing on admin stuff and um, making sure that you are um, portraying the agency in a certain way and you're meeting agency goals, not necessarily 100% focus on meeting client goals. And I think that's a really hard struggle. Um, and I, 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 all agencies, I think, have to face that because you have to be profitable as an agency, but you also have to do good work for your clients. So sometimes those two things aren't necessarily going hand in hand and it's a bit of tension. Yeah, I've run into that a lot. Um, you know, spend most of my life in agencies and that was always a struggle, right? It's like, you know, when <laughs> you, you would go through and do your, you know, OKRs or do your types of, you know, review stuff. It's like your review is based on 
you know, with the agency and the revenue you bring to the agency, but at the same time, it's like getting numbers for your clients are, is, is, is number one and resigning. Right. So that should be part of the, the overall goals. And, and, um, we, we had an interview once and, and, uh, the person we interviewed basically said the clients are the ones that pay your salary <laughs> because, you know, the, that's how the agency is getting their money to pay you. So it's really not the agency paying you. The client is actually paying you. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in your case, being, you know, uh, at Arrows Up, you know, that's more the case. But at an agency, it's like something that you don't really think of because mm-hmm. you think of it as the the whole goal uh, or the whole agency um, is kind of all the money they're bringing is paying you. But really, those clients are the ones that pay you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the I've spent a lot of time in agencies as, as well. And I feel I don't know, man, I, th- I think that I I might just be like a a weird bird, but I feel like when I've had situations where I've been in house versus agency and agency is really, really hard. Sometimes I, for whatever reason, do better in agencies. So maybe I'm like one of those people that enjoys the, I don't actually, I'm not going to say, I don't enjoy the pressure, but I, I, I think I perform well under that sort of stress and pressure. And I think that is one of the bigger challenges of agency agency life is that there is a certain amount of stress that comes along with it. It's not saying in-house is not stressful. It's just way different problems. The stress of agency life uh, is uh, managing all of the stakeholder expectations, but not just doing that, doing it like five different times a day across five different industries because you're split in some cases, like there have been agencies that I've been at where I've had like 40 clients. Well, how do you be successful on any one of them when you have that many clients? Uh, and, and uh, you know, even now I've got, I've got less, but it's still a lot of clients. So it, it becomes a real challenge to one, just keep everything straight, keep the ball moving forward in terms of your production execution, and then figuring out ways to get them to execute your recommendations. Because on the agency side, that's your biggest problem, right? Getting the clients who are actually paying you to help them to actually execute your recommendations. That's a that's the type of stuff that keeps me up at night, but then also falling back into the the whole idea of like, well, actually the client's paying your salary. So like, you know, whatever, if you're getting results or you're not getting results, they may renew or they may not renew. And really in agency world, the most important thing is winning new clients and getting them to, to renew at the agency level. Of course, making your clients successful is a huge component of that. Uh, but when it comes down to it, there are times where clients don't implement your recommendations, but because they love you and the working relationship, they still renew. Um, so that's kind of, I've realized over the course of time, because I've been personally frustrated in some cases where like r- recommendations just sit in the client's queue forever. But then like, as I've gotten older, I realize like, look, things may not happen as quickly as I want, but the bottom line is, did they renew or did they not renew? Yeah, right. And, yeah, and, that, and it, that for me, it's a little sad, but it's, it's the truth. And being my first time on the in-house side of things like that, I, I mean, you still have a lot of those pressures, um, but at the same time, it's like, we, you know, Helen, as you said, we're kind of all working to common goals. Um, mm-hmm. We've set those goals apart. And and the other good part is I get to go over and nudge some of those developers now or, or nudge some of those people that where things are sitting in queue. And and um, I have meetings on like why my stuff's at the bottom of the queue and why can how can I move it up? Um, so So – depending on the in-house you go to, <laughs> there, there could be some of that other end that I have, like I have zero skills in right now because I've always been like a consultant where like, here's my work. It's in the queue. I'll explain, I'll build decks. I'll tell everything you need to do to, to move that up, but I don't have any control on that. So now that I have some control, it's like, it's, it's actually a new skill I'm trying to learn. <laughs> it's like, is that like this skill, like, you know, you go to a conference and they say, you know how you get developers to do stuff? You go, like, go buy them coffee and do things like that. And I was like, well, I'm a consultant across the globe. I can't like do stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, now I can a little bit. So it's... yeah, you have to stock up on uh, bribes and treats. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of my, what, one of my biggest uh, shocker moments when I went from agency back in house was that like an agency world, 
you use Dex to communicate everything. So like 30, I would say 30% of my time in any given day is building a damn deck. Uh, decks for getting clients to do to do this or showing showing results or decks for if you have like speaking engagements or whatever. And when I went in house and they're like, dude, why did you create a deck? You could have been spending that time working. I was like, I don't know how to yeah. communicate in <laughs> any other way. Just bear with me. <laughs> yep. I've, I've experienced that myself. <laughs> oh, OK. So let's get I, mean, I feel like we're Jeff, we're talking about ourselves too much. Like we got to stop that. Um, so, Helen. You're at the you're you're at an agency for quite a while, and what makes you want to take the leap to found your own agency? It was something that I was considering for a good six months before I actually did it. I think I I've never wanted to own a business. The whole idea terrifies me, but they got me to too. a point where I thought I just have to try it. And I say it took six months. Um, it was really probably only because um, I got married that year. Uh, so was it last year? Um, so I had that kind of extra salary propping me up. Um, we no longer had a wedding that we had to pay for. So the timing was kind of good in that sense that it was, uh, I had that kind of opportunity to fail. Um, so six months of, uh, my husband said, just do it, just go freelance. Just, you've been talking about it forever. Just please just go freelance. Um, I finally thought, Oh, maybe I should do it. So I started getting all my ducks in a row and kind of sort of putting feelers out for, how would I get clients and how much of the industry can I kind of tap up um, people that I know in my network, that kind of thing. I eventually thought, you know, what, I've just got to do it. Um, it I had actually been offered um, a job, a really good job in London for the kind of money that I never thought anyone would ever pay me. Um, and so I had this amazing job in one hand, an agency job up in London, and then the prospect of just going freelance. And it was a kind of real tension of, the sensible thing to do is to take a really good job in London and just do that. But I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So that's the point I thought I'm just gonna have to go freelance because if I'm turning down that kind of job that normally would really excite me and be something that I'd absolutely jump at, then clearly I've got to give this freelancing a go. Um, and that was kind of the the catalyst for me. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I think had coronavirus and the pandemic not happened I think I'd probably be a considerable um, amount further forward than I am currently but it's been an incredible year uh, of learning about what it is to run your own business and what being a freelancer really means and yeah so really fascinating so far. And for those people that are considering the same jump that you're considering to uh, to to become a consultant or to start an agency what advice would you give to them now that you are about a year into it? Make friends with other consultants. I've had so much work referred to me. I've been able to refer work on. And that's a really nice feeling, actually, when I've got some people saying, you know, I don't have the capacity to do this right now. But I've got this amazing SEO person I know who absolutely would be great for your company and being able to refer it on. Um, word of mouth is a huge thing. So make friends in the industry. Um, that's probably my number one tip. But then past that is actually really considering the legality, the finances, the admin that goes into being your own boss, because um, I think we all have these illusions that it's going to be so much more free time. I can be so much flexible in the work I do and I can say no to clients that I don't agree with and all this kind of thing. But when push comes to shove, you've got to be legally compliant, which is something that most of which just kind of goes over my head. Um, you've got to get your finances in order. You have to understand how tax works. If you're going to start hiring people, then that's a whole nother level of uh, difficulty and confusion. So really kind of understand what it entails before you do that, because it could be a bit of a shock for you otherwise. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my my two main tips for people who are considering this. And how much time would you say you do doing the... it? running the business administrative sorts of things versus doing the actual work yeah way too much way too much <laughs> it would really if you had to put it if you had to put a percentage on it um probably about 95 percent admin to five percent actual seo wow. um, no, no 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 nothing that i was bad. gonna say i was like holy shit <laughs> yeah she's definitely doing something wrong if that's the case um no i'd probably say i'm probably spending a good few hours a week probably two three sometimes more hours a week just doing things like uh, speaking to the accountant chasing invoices chasing the invoices a second time um admin things making sure that i've uh, 
submitted taxes and all that kind of jazz. I'm probably doing that a good few hours a week. And then you've got on top of that, um, marketing stuff and promotional mm -hmm. things and actually getting my name out there and all that sort of thing, which I absolutely love, but is equally um, a drain on time. Yeah. So that in itself is a good few hours more a week. So you're almost talking like maybe one day a week, a day that you don't have is essentially spent on doing things like admin and self-marketing and self-promotion, that kind of thing. And then the rest of the time is as much of the actual SEO work as you're willing to take on. So yeah. I do know some consultants who just work seven days a week. One of those days will be on the admin side of it and the other six is on making money for themselves. Um, I found a bit of a better uh, work-life balance than that, but sometimes it can be a seven day a week job and um, it's just not sustainable in my opinion. So yeah, you yeah. kind of have to turn some clients away in order to have a weekend, that kind of thing, because that admin yeah. stuff is never going away. That's always going to be the constant. Yeah, I would say these are everything that you're describing, perfectly described describes all of the reasons that I have not yet had the courage to kind of make that jump um, because I I have no great passion for the administrative side of things for things like project management like that just has no appeal to me and it's not a special only the, breed it is a special breed and not only that uh, I think the fear of going a certain length of time with not having a guaranteed income even though the potential, to uh, out earn your salary is is always out there. Uh, I I would have a, a I don't know. I'm a creature creature of habit, and I like having something like that that I can depend on. And that uncertainty is is for me very scary. Yeah, and I think for me the hardest thing I found is that inability to just switch off. Like I I need recharge time. I think we all do really, but um, I want yeah. a good couple of days a week where people aren't emailing me and expecting an answer, or I'm not getting phone calls from clients at three thirty on a Sunday afternoon. Like that that for me has been a real test of my boundaries and ensuring that actually. I'm putting those boundaries in and I'm sticking to them because at the end of the day, there are very few actual genuine SEO emergencies. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's probably more likely a dev emergency than it is an SEO emergency, unless I've done something really wrong. Um, so yeah. there's not a real need to be calling me at 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon. There's definitely not a need for me to pick up that phone call because it's not healthy to be constantly switched on for seven days a week on your business. Oh, so no. Yeah, you do have to have downtime. Um, so I want to, before we kind of get into the core episode topic, which is website migrations, I've got maybe a couple of more questions. So one, you, you talked a little bit about uh, promotion, which lends itself to speaking and speaking at, speaking at conferences and, and putting your name out there. Uh, so I guess talk about your approach and how you made the transition to doing that. And for those people that aren't comfortable with public speaking, how did you personally, um, maybe, you know, maybe you are one of those people that's comfortable, but if you're not, how have you kind of gotten yourself to a place where you are comfortable up on the stage talking to other SEOs? I think for me, it's the reason I ended up talking um, public speaking for SEOs because I was actually doing outside of work in, in other areas of my life. Um, and it's at that point that I realized I absolutely love it. Like it's completely counter to my nature. Um, I grew up incredibly shy. Uh, but, um, I think the first time I was actually on stage talking to a group of people, it was just like a, it was like a high. It was so fun. I really enjoyed every moment of it. Um, the fact that I have a captive audience, for my jokes is really helpful. Um, so yeah, it was something that I absolutely love. And I love teaching and I love explaining. So that kind of um, looking out into the crowd and seeing the people are nodding and maybe writing notes is, a, is an amazing feeling. They're probably just writing their shopping list in all honesty, but the idea that they're perhaps understanding and learning something from me is, is really cool. So um, for me, um, I will chase down any speaking opportunity I can. It's, it's not even for real sort of self-promotion it's just because I love doing it. Um, there's a few uh, conference organizers out there who have been hounded by me. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you sure you to speak at your next event? They're like, I don't know who you are. Stop emailing me. <laughs> so um, it's probably how I got some of my speaking opportunities anyway. Um, but yeah, it was really, um, I, I just applied for Brian SEO. That was probably my first major SEO speaking opportunity. Um, Kelvin is great in that he will let first timers up on stage. And I think that's a really awesome kind of attitude yeah. to have because there are so many people out there who 
haven't got a, a list of um, events that they've spoken at in the past, but actually have got a really important message and they've got some really cool research they've been working on or they've just got, they've worked out something that the rest of us need to hear about, but because they don't have that long list of speaking credentials, they don't get an opportunity. Whereas Brian SEO is really good in that it welcomes first time speakers on stage, uh, sometimes onto the main stage. And that's quite, um, that's quite brave of the team, I think. Um, but you, that's the way you get yeah. the fresh in the industry. And I think that's really awesome. I, so I, they gave me my first big break and it kind of went from there really. Uh, and I think that's exactly why we are excited about the initiative um, with United United Search that they're doing. It's not just important for first time speakers, um, but it's important um, to have a lot of a lot of diversity, which leads me to my next thing is that you are um, highly involved with the Women in Tech SEO group uh, founded by another Page Two Podcast alum. It's really cool to um, you, to have had a lot of these uh, really uh, industry leading and forward people to have the opportunity to talk, talk to them and call them alums of our podcast. But the uh, the person behind that is Arij Abu Ali. Uh, and she's been amazing. And quite honestly, she should, if any award that she has not won uh, for 2020, like up and comer person of the year, like, good Lord, she's done so much for the industry. So I want to take a take a moment to just say like, good for her, good for you, Areej, you're, you're doing a great job. Um, that being said, uh, what has been your experience, Helen, with uh, the Women in Tech SEO group? I recommend it to any woman who is in uh, SEO, any woman or um, person who identifies as female, because I think it's such a blessing. Um, Areej is amazing. I just want to echo that. She has been such a force for good in the industry. Um, and it's it's really good to see her starting to be recognised for that. So that's just awesome. But in terms of, um, I'm quite active on the Slack channel, for instance, for um, women in tech SEO. And it's just amazing to have a group of people who are just on hand to answer any of my questions about SEO. It's really, so I've even had it for, um, in terms of being a freelancer, being a consultant, there's a, a, a Slack channel set up for that. So there's other people in a very similar situation to me that I can just ask what quite basic questions of, and they've got a load of experience to help answer those questions for me. And what I love about it is there are some incredibly knowledgeable people in that group who have got sometimes decades of experience within marketing and digital, um, and they will spend time answering people's questions, even if they're quite basic questions or questions you think, you could probably have Googled that and got an answer. They're actually taking the time to, to address those questions. And, it's a really edifying environment to be in. It's a really good um, situation to be in where you know you can ask a question and you're not going to get oh, that's a stupid question or you should know this. Call yourself an SEO. I thought you'd been in the industry for years, but actually people just answer it. Um, I have a lot of um, nervousness and fear around publicly um, like asking questions on Twitter or even like sharing articles I've written or um, kind of that self promotion because you get trolls, you get negative comments, you get people just being rude for the sake of being rude. So to actually have an environment where I can just kind of maybe say, oh, I just spoke at this podcast, you want to have a listen? And people are like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm definitely going to listen. It's really edifying. It's a nice kind of breath of fresh air for the industry, I think. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. So Jeff, let's, uh, let's move on to the core, core topic. topic. We need to have come up with a fancy name there and maybe like a intro with some fresh beats. Uh, I'll look for I'll look for the fresh beats. All right, <laughs> they're gonna be the Dw they're gonna be the Dwight Schrute fresh beats. Nice <laughs> from his farm. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So our core topic this week is website migrations. Um, unless you're Joe Noel Alderson, who doesn't believe there's such a thing as a migration. <laughs> uh, well, it's just the, it's all about definitions at that point, but. In general, you know, I think uh, being on the tech side of SEO, I think we've probably everyone on this call has been, you know, has done a bunch of migrations. But um, so, I, I mean, in, in definition, I would say like a migration is just, um, it could be a migration, could be a redesign, could be moving from CMS to CMS. There's many different types of migrations out there. Um, so Helen, like, uh, like, what are kind of some of the migrations that you've, you know, worked on and, you know, kind of, um, we'll go into deeper into it, but like some of the challenges that you've found and, and things like that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'd even probably go further. And again, it is just definition, so feel free to ignore me. Yeah. I'd probably <laughs> say that a website migration is anything um, or any time a significant change happens to a large portion of the website, like because anything that can have kind of a, like a good definition. Impact. Yeah. Um, even if that's not really the definition, that's kind of I like to take migration steps whenever that's happening, just to yeah. kind of mitigate any issues that might come off the back of that. Um, but yes, in terms of migrations, I think I've I've migrated somewhere in the region of 40, 50, maybe more websites um, in my time. I spent a good 18 months at um, an agency and all I was doing was website migrations, back to back website migrations, day in, day out. <laughs> it's a low point in life. Um, I learned an awful lot from that. A lot of stuff yeah. that I never want to repeat. But um, yeah, it was a it was a very formative experience just constantly working with website migrations high stress but um yeah useful in the long run um but i've i've worked on all kinds of different um website migrations from simple redesigns to uh domain changes to everything's happening all at once and we want it done tomorrow i've had website migrations where i've been told about the website um plan two days before launch are we going to always the best migrate our website okay <laughs> when next month next year oh tomorrow awesome like um, I've had websites that have launched at seven o'clock in the evening without anyone being told about it. It's anything that could go wrong with a website migration. I've pretty much experienced. I think yeah. um, I've kind of settled on the conclusion that with website migrations, probably something is going to go wrong because you've got so many different people involved, so many different yeah. priorities that your job as an SEO is trying to mitigate that wherever possible and then just do what you can do yeah. and then just work on the remedial stuff if you have to afterwards the the dirty word that nobody talks it's it's a it's a, a phrase um, two phrases I would say that I that I tell people about website migrations it is risk mitigation number one goal risk mitigation and I had a client say this to me probably eight years ago now but it's so true during a website migration flat is the new up flat is the new up that's I can't describe it anything more perfectly than that. Your goal is to not drop off the face of the earth. That's it. Yeah. You can yep. do that. It's successful. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely that. And um, whenever I talk to clients about um, an upcoming website migration, I always give the advice, change as little as you possibly can. Like if you are changing from one domain to another, then nothing else on your website changes, friends. Content stays the same. URL structure stays the same. Design stays the same. All I want to see is that domain name change and that's it. Mm -hmm. Or if you are moving onto a different platform, you're replatforming, absolutely nothing changes apart from the code that is powering that website. Like as much as you can minimize as possible is better, um, simply because you're going to reduce the risk of stuff going wrong, but you can also then audit it a lot better if stuff does go wrong. So if you know all you've changed is A and B, then you don't need to look at C, D, E, and F because that shouldn't have changed. So it kind of helps you with that after the migration, making right. sure that you do just get flat traffic and nothing dropping off yeah now we I've, i'm at a, a company now where i wasn't part of the migration but um so wirecutter.com was its own website we moved into the new york times um during my interview process so i really didn't have anything to do with it but um that was pretty much the approach nothing changed except for the url or like the domain um and and we, we were lucky we saw like very little drop and now we're seeing tons of gains from being on you know, a top 30 website, but um, it was, it's scary. You know, it's scary anytime you do that. Um, so what are some of the, the aspects that you look at um, to help minimize some of that drop and, and possible gain when we do a, a migration? I, I kind of take it in two parts. I look at both what is going to change and what do I need to do to deal with those changes and what can I ensure is keeping the same. So of what I know is going to change, how do I check that it's been done in a way that is good for the website? So um, a lot of the time it's kind of talking to the stakeholders and there's often a lot of stakeholders in the migration. Um, when you're agency side, you're probably potentially working with a dev agency as well as the client, as well as possibly a content agency. Um, they might have a separate performance marketing agency that's separate to your SEO agency. And suddenly you've got a lot of fingers um, involved in this website migration and a lot of people possibly messing stuff up. So. Um, yeah, I kind of put project management hat on, even if I'm not the project manager, and just start trying to organize those kind of things. Well, what are you in charge of? What are you going to change? What are you doing? What are you going to mess up? And kind of getting a real grip on what's going to change and how can I ensure it's made 
um, in a way that's going to be beneficial for the website. And then what isn't supposed to change? So what can I monitor to make sure it's staying the same? So like uh, you're not changing any of the content, you're not changing the URL structure. So your canonical tags should not change. So what can I do to check that those are staying as they were previously and kind of trying to match up the old site with the new site and making sure that there's not much variation there apart from that, those things that I knew were supposed to be changing. Yeah, I like to, uh, if I am brought in early, which is always the goal, because you don't want to be that two hours before launch mm -hmm. or worse, like um, coming in like six months after a terrible launch and you're trying to <laughs> redo six months worth of bad work. Um, but I, I, I like to scare people a little bit. I like mm -hmm. to, to show them like, this is what can happen if you do it wrong. And that way you just get their attention and mm -hmm. you tend to end up being in meetings that one, you probably don't need to be into, but at the same time, like I, I want to see things in dev. I want to see the, like, even if it's a daily, like I just want to be access, have access to it so I can start picking things apart. And I know it's still a work in progress, but at the same time, I want to make sure this work is in progress. <laughs> It, yeah, it, it's it, it's probably I, Jeff. All I'm picturing is that that old 1980s. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs, yeah, and exactly. they crack <laughs> eggs into the fryer. So I'm just yep. picturing you walking into the room, cracking the eggs into the fryer, and saying, "This is your website. This is your website yep. on drugs. What do you want?" <laughs> I don't and know it, why that came into my brain. <laughs> and and I, I kind of go with the approach opposite of. Helen's company's name. I say this is what happens arrows down yeah. if you don't do it right. So yeah, exactly. um, it's one of the and and it, it happens. I've seen companies lose five million dollars, nine million dollars off of a bad yeah. implementation, and then you're spending the next six months trying to get it back to just be even, <laughs> and and that's 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 tough times, um, especially in these tight economies where you know like now and I don't I haven't. Well, I'm not, I haven't been on the agency side, but it's like really hard probably right now to like take the chance to redesign your website, um, even though this is the best time to probably do it while you're, you know, you know, kind of maybe slower on the client side or something like that is the ability to like rebuild your, your brand. It's just tough to do it. Um, and, and we definitely like that migration. If it goes bad, it can go bad. So yeah. it's, oh, man, yeah. I, I was going to say the I've been a been a part of good migrations, but the best ones to the funnest ones to talk about are the really bad, the really bad ones. And um, I will say at a previous agency, it, it did not go bad because the client made a mistake. It went bad because our agency who was also developing the website did it so completely wrong. And the entire time leading up to the launch kept raising the red flag, raising the red flag. This is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. And then it launches and I'm, you know, with the client going, I don't think this is going to go well. You should stop this launch. And by that point, like too many stakeholders were involved and they're like, there's nothing's going to stop this, this launch. So they launch and in the first month they lose $20 million, right? Because they just results tank a lot of old content that was there before, which is a huge problem. For whatever reason, a lot of times when companies move websites, they want to get rid of a bunch of content. Well, that's all well and good, except if that content is driving organic visibility and driving traffic. Uh, but the, the problem with that is the people developing the website aren't always or often looking at the performance, right? They're just making a lot of these decisions decisions in a vacuum. So as an, as an SEO, it's our job to, as much as we can within the, the politics, and politics are a very real thing, get in people's ear, show them data, and show them if you remove this content, this is what you're going to lose. And in the case of that one, um, it, suffice it to say, they came back to us pretty quickly and said, with tail between legs, firmly between legs, saying, help us fix it help tell us what we did wrong. And I'm like, guys, I was telling you the whole time, you just chose not to listen, <laughs> chose not to listen. Um, so Helen, uh, speaking of when things go wrong, uh, if you had to pick a number one thing, uh, a number one thing that you have to get right in a migration, um, what is it? Probably number one thing that you should absolutely do uh, when migrating a website that unfortunately a lot of um, agencies that I've worked with or clients that I've worked with have failed to do is listen to Helen 
when I tell you to do something, just do the thing. Exactly. You can argue with me, do the thing. Um, and, and I think Jeff came up with your slogan. If you don't listen to Helen, arrows down, bitches. Arrows yeah, yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> That's going on the website tomorrow. There you yeah. go. Um, but it's so true. Like You've hired an SEO to help you the website migration. Maybe listen to the SEO. They do kind of know what they're talking about. Um, and I think really it's something that's probably never going to be achievable, but just full collaboration with all of the stakeholders, with all of the teams. I don't want to have to keep fighting people to add the canonical tag the way it should be added. It shouldn't be a discussion. Just do it. Like It's it's something I find so frustrating or um, telling the clients, okay, you want to, to get rid of some of your content, but what I'm telling you is it's driving you a substantial amount of traffic at the moment. That traffic converts. So if you get rid of that content, you're going to see a drop in traffic and potentially conversions. Uh, are you sure you want to do it? Oh, you do want to do it. Okay. Oh, but you want traffic to stay the same. You want traffic to go up and you're expecting more conversions off the back of this. Okay. But it's it's that kind of collaboration between all of the different teams and stakeholders. You've got to all be on the same page. And I get that um, different teams are going to have different pressures. The project management team just want the project to come in on or under budget in or under time they just want that website launched and they don't want to have to think about it again the development team have got to make a functioning website that's what they're being paid to do that's what they want to do and they don't want someone like me coming along saying have you checked the thing have you done the bit and then i just kind of i know you've done it that way but can you really rebuild it please and i get that that's always going to be a source of tension but there shouldn't really be an excuse as to why we don't all just get together right at the beginning of the website migration right at the beginning in the planning stages and actually work out a plan that works for all of those teams and all of those stakeholders and just go from there and then repeat for the next website it should be it should be that simple build it right at the beginning so that i don't have to tell you to rebuild it later on right and and the there's a reason for for that because sometimes the seos are brought in too late but i have experienced other times where the developers are like this stupid SEO doesn't know what they're talking about. Don't tell me how to do my job. And that's when developer relations becomes a very, very real, um, real thing in a, in a, in a real issue. I was that developer at one time. Yeah. Get out of here, SEO people. uh, I had a developer (laughs) once, and this is, this is one of my better, most like stories that just makes me like, "Mm." um, I had a, a, a client that we were doing very good work for, and we were doing migration-like ac- activities. And we were in the meeting, uh, and we were all sitting in this like horseshoe configuration, and the, the client people were kind of intermixed with the agency people. And it just so happens I'm sitting on one side, and I'm kind of going through the performance, the anticipated performance. This is what you you really need to take seriously from an implementation standpoint. And as I'm speaking on the other side, their lead developer is sitting next to one of my colleagues. And my colleague just so happens to be like, he just glances over at their screen as I'm speaking. And he told me about this later. And this developer is going, yeah, I'm not going to fucking do that. Fuck this guy. And I apologize for the language, but that's like that, that made me so furious. And once I heard that, I was like, I just, I don't think there's anything that I'm going to be able to do to reach this guy. This guy is one of those people that's just all out on the, you know, the SEO is, is stupid. And that's, that's unfortunate. There are things that you can do to work better um, with developers, but then there are just those, those people. I think that's uh, it. It's not, it's not developers necessary. There's just always people who yeah. you know, want to have to go that extra mile to accommodate yeah. the stuff that you're asking for. Or um, I do remember a fairly similar situation, I guess, in that I was in a meeting for um, a quite well-known university who were migrating part of their website. And um, the project manager was a self-proclaimed SEO expert. So I'm sat in the room against this person who's an SEO expert and I'm feeling kind of nervous, like, what if I don't know as much as him because he's an SEO expert and the project manager and here am I, just me, uh, trying to talk about this website migration. And I just kind of tentatively raise my hand at one point and say, so can you let me know when there's going to be a content freeze on the old site and the new site so that I can start mapping the redirects? And he just looked at me and said, why do you want to map redirects? I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Why do I want to map redirects? So the website doesn't tank? That's kind of the the whole point of it. 
Um, you, say, well, you, you can just map the redirects after the website's launched. I've never heard of people doing it in advance. I don't. Yeah. Well, what? <laughs> I did, and I took a moment. I thought, that was, have let's I see how that works out for you, pal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think you're always just going to have people who've either done things a different way or have always done something the same and just don't want to have to change and adapt. So um, right. and with migrations, it brings out the worst in everyone because we're all under pressure. Um, so mm -hmm. people really do want to just stick to their lane and not have to get involved in other people's stuff. So I can see why yeah. it happens. But it's just so frustrating. Yeah, my favorite would be when they say like, okay, we, we can do redirects, but only like 20. Oh, our, our, yeah. our systems can't handle like can't the, handle. The 5, that you want to you do. want a thousand one-to-one -one redirects no everything's <laughs> going to have to be uh, uh regex rules and oh by the way some of our most of our redirects we're going to point them to the home page um i was going to get to tac tactically and i got a little bit of off track <laughs> uh if you're changing your urls which i don't advise or you're changing your domain like one-to-one one-to-one -one, one -one redirects i know it takes a long time uh, figure out a way to prioritize by traffic one to one redirects. If I had to pick a single most important thing, one to one redirects, do as many as you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've never migrated to a site where I haven't done that. Um, possibly because I haven't had sites that kind of several million pages big and I've not needed to do it on a, say like a template basis. Um, but I couldn't feel comfortable <laughs> If I hadn't have done that, I need to know yeah. that the redirects and I'm going to go through line by line checking that they're accurate or not. And there are ways you can automate it to an extent. There's ways you can kind of mm -hmm. speed it up a bit. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be checking, is it going to the right page or not? Because that's a fundamental thing that could go wrong. Um, yeah. And if you're not doing those page to page redirects, then you're yeah. potentially opening yourself up for a lot of errors. Yeah. So, so before we move on to the Twitter questions, uh, any closing thoughts on website migrations? Yes, don't do them if you can. <laughs> that will help it. And I, I, I mean that seriously. Like, don't just think, oh, it's a new year. We're going to redesign the website because yeah. there's so much more that goes into it. Um, and you should think long and hard. It's a huge thing and a huge undertaking for any business migrating a website. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand that because they think it's just a new design. It's a fresh look. Oh, we get brand new yep. up-to-date website. But actually, the risk that is involved is really high. So don't just do it on a whim. Don't get a new website every year or uh, think, oh, we just want to change the design and it won't have much of an impact because it could have a huge, a huge impact. Yeah. I mean, look at companies like Amazon or Yahoo or any, like, when was the last time you saw a drastic redesign of everything? Yeah. It's always done in elements. Maybe the navigation moves a little bit, maybe something like that. But that's one of the things I would say is like, does it have to be that drastic? Could it be something that is done over time, 50 steps instead of one giant step? Because I feel that um, that big giant step is where you just, it just confuses everyone, confuses Google, confuses your, you know, your readers and, and, and people coming to your site. Um, and, and a lot of times confuses the people who like work at the company because they're like, Oh, I know where this piece of content is that you need. Oh wait, it's not there anymore. <laughs> so, so a lot of times like everyone has to relearn everything where I feel that like if you do it in little steps, um, it may take longer, but it's a lot less dev time. Um, unless it's something major, like you need to get off of WordPress two because you need to get onto the new you know, WordPress, mm -hmm. but even still, like you can change that back end out without changing much of the front end and then start going after the front end stuff. So I'll, before we move on, I'll give my, my closing thought, um, outside of tactically speaking, the bigger your site is, the longer runtime you should have in terms of notice. So if you're dealing with a small site, I would say three to six months to, from beginning to completion is minimum, right? For planning, planning, execution, and impl implementation. If you're dealing with a big site, 12 to 18 months is the rule. You should not attempt a migration, a domain change, a replatform, a redesign. And by the way, fa phased is a great way to do it because it mitigates risk. Uh, but if you think that you can take your 1 million page site and do a migration in three months, that's a lot of risk to take on. And again, it's all about uh, risk mitigation. So I would say give your people enough time. And not only that, do not set an arbitrary date and hold yourself to that date. A lot of times organizational politics play in and sites get launched when they're not ready because some 
leader, executive, whatever, set a date that had to be hit. Does it have to be? No, no, it doesn't. A lot of times the deadlines that are being set are arbitrarily put in there because somebody has said this needs to happen by this time. And sometimes they're aligned with campaigns or times of year or promotional events. And that part makes sense. But when it's not aligned to something that is business critical and it's just a date that you pull out of thin air, it can move back. Uh, and, and when I say move back, I don't mean a quarter or six months. I mean, it can move back a day to fix something. It can move back a week and that's not going to hurt anything. Uh, it's all about launching. And if you've got some stuff that you really need in there, especially on the SEO side, that's not at launch, just push it back a day. So that's my advice. Thank All right. Much. So let's uh, let's move on to the Twitter questions. And I'm going to apologize. Uh, we did not give uh, our audience, our very limited audience, uh, uh, a whole lot of time. Uh, it's been a crazy, crazy week. Uh, but I will say we had the search discovery team come through in a big way. Uh, not all of them are on Twitter. One of them, one of them is, uh, but on a big, in a big way uh, when it comes to asking some really, really great questions. Uh, so the first question, so what we're going to do, we'll go through the questions uh, and then at the end, we'll pick a winner. Uh, you guys, so uh, Jeff and Helen, you guys will pick the winner uh, between you and that winner is going to get a sticker. What I'm going to say about the stickers is we've got blue, green, and pink. Most of the people who have won the sticker have gone for blue. Uh, Dan Liebson, who won the sticker last week, went for pink, and nobody likes the green sticker. So I'm hoping that maybe somebody will pick the green sticker because it's pretty awesome. Um, anyways, first question comes from Kyle Rose at Rose underscore KW on Twitter. So with the impact that COVID-19 has had on local businesses, have you found an SEO strategy that has worked best across the board for local SEO? Oh, that's a good question. Um, honest answer is no, I haven't. Not one that's gonna work across the board. I think every company is gonna to have to take it um, on an individual basis and work out what works best for them. I think the companies that I've seen that are doing really well at the moment are those that have diversified. So um, I just think of, a, I've, I've got a local restaurant near me that I absolutely love. Um, and of course, uh, in the UK, we've, we're in the middle of lockdown at the moment. So restaurants um, are limited in what they can do. You can have takeaway service, but I don't think, I can't remember, I don't think you're allowed to sit in the restaurant at the moment. Um, so this particular restaurant has changed its whole way of operating and it now offers hampers and is selling hampers via e-commerce instead. Um, so completely different change of direction for them, but it's working for them at the moment. I think companies that are going to do well during COVID-19 are those that are really looking at, well, what does the market actually want and what is it possible at the moment? Um, Ecom obviously is going to be doing fairly well at the moment because people aren't leaving the house going to shops as much, especially not in the UK. So what can I as a small local business do to mean that I can still reach my customers in a manner that they are still wanting to engage with me in so can I get online I didn't I've I don't know potentially you've got a Facebook page we don't have a website yet can you get a website can you start looking at e-com options for for what you do at the moment so kind of really adapting is the best that you can do and I think that applies to SEO as well like how much can you adapt with what you're offering so you're meeting people with their current needs rather than the needs they've had kind of 12 months ago 18 months ago before COVID was a big issue. Excellent, excellent, great answer. Um, next question comes from Dalton Maddox. How is local SEO, primarily GMB, uh, and that's Google My Business for those of you that don't know that acronym, uh, different between the UK and the US? Ha has she, so have you uh, noticed any different trends between the two? Oh, again, another good question. So I think uh, for me, it's a bit hard to comment on the US because all of my US clients are being e-com based rather than local businesses. Um, but I can talk about the UK and UK Google My Business is, I think it's really similar in the US. We've got a lot of spam going on at the moment, um, a lot of rubbish in the search results. Um, people who are using their, uh, describing what they do and using that as their um, their title and their company name on Google My Business. I think it's a, the same across both sides of the pond. And that's really hard to combat. And it's really frustrating to see. Um, so when you're trying to do things ethically and correctly, according to Google's guidelines, and you're getting beaten in the uh, map pack by um, Larry, the plumber who also does bathrooms, 
like it's quite frustrating when that's the that's literally what you're reading uh, in the the GMB of the person who's ranking above you. So it's yeah, it, I think it's just the same both sides of the pond, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I know Google tries to deal with it, but it's just not quite keeping up at the moment. And I think given um, the change in the economy, change in the market at the moment, we're seeing a lot more of it because people are getting desperate. And um, those that perhaps haven't really turned to digital as their primary form of marketing previously are having to do it now. And so they are discovering new things like, oh, a website or oh, Google My Business is a thing. And they don't know how to do it properly necessarily. Um, so you're getting a lot more of this kind of people chancing it and trying stuff. Um, and that's why you end up with uh, rubbish in, in the local results, unfortunately. Sounds like Larry is a good candidate for a new domain name, Larry the Plumber, who also does <laughs> bathrooms.info. <laughs> 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 okay. There's, there's, a, there's a, a show, uh, the host is named Danny Seo, which is SEO. And I, oh, like, yeah. I always would laugh because I was like, you're just naturally getting like SEO traffic to your site. And he responded and he was just like, oh, yeah. He's like, this is great. He's like, I get it doesn't matter. He just wants the clicks, you know. So <laughs> He was born into it. Yeah. Um, so last question comes from Chris Vankara, also on the search discovery team. A uh, bunch of great people work with me. Uh, how have you been preparing clients for the Core Web Vitals rollout in May? Any challenges, pushback, et cetera? Yeah, the real challenge is, is that it's May and May is a long time away for most companies right now. And it's just not priority. It's just when there are tight budgets and there are other much more pressing concerns talking about, well, did you know that you might get a Google, uh, you might struggle in Google next year because you're, you've got really bad uh, jumpy layout on your website. And they're like, I don't care. I need to pay myself. And that's the primary focus right now is keeping my business running. So I think for a lot of companies, it's something that's too far off in the future and they don't fully understand it. And it's not something they're going to be working on now. Um, and I think that's a real challenge as SEOs in all types of industry um, that you've got to try and communicate that actually the things you're recommending are going to benefit in the long run and try to justify the budget that it might take. And something that's a, a little bit hard for some people to grasp, uh, things like the core web vitals and load speed and all of that kind of thing that most managing directors of companies who aren't necessarily digitally savvy don't really want to listen to you talk about um, because they've got a whole host of other things that I need to focus on right now. And it's really hard for you to get those kind of recommendations through. And especially things like the core web vitals, it's quite difficult for you to necessarily show the potential growth there or the potential damage that could be done if it's not fixed. It's really difficult to kind of forecast with those. We don't quite know what's going to happen yet. We don't know how much of an impact it's going to have. Um, we don't know if it's going to be like uh, previous uh, load speed um, algorithmic updates that kind of haven't necessarily had a huge impact on the SERPs, or is it going to be something that's going to be mammoth? And actually, it's going to be really important for people to get that right. We just don't know yet. And so until you can get some of those case studies where you can show people that actually, if you don't deal with this, you're going to see this amount of drop in your visibility, then it's really hard to get those kind of changes pushed through at a time when people are just struggling to keep their businesses going. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've really been trying to push internally at my company where it's not just SEO, right? It's like, I, I'm coming at it as an SEO saying this is going to affect your rankings, but Google is calling these like experience metrics. It affects everything on the site and, and, you know, page speed is more than just SEO. It is more like it is, you know, your customers coming in and how satisfied they are on your site. And that is totally to me is what I'm pushing. I guess it's SEO, but it's also customer satisfaction on our site. So if people are more satisfied on another site, they're going to be leaving and going to that site. So our goal is just to, you know, or my goal in general is like, yes, this is great for SEO. I'll take the lead on this, but I want everybody to be, you know, a part of this and, and trying to get those metrics into our daily reporting. Mm -hmm. I want to know how many, how many um, readers came in or how many, you know, customers came in. And I also want to know if like a page, got better in the core web vitals? Did we see better engagement or did we see less engagement? And, and really trying to get those numbers into our daily analytics. That's that's kind of my battle right now. Um, let alone, it's funny, six months is so far away for some companies and for other companies that plan really far ahead. Mm -hmm. That's like, and have like big websites, like that's actually pretty close. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if you're running it, like site speed stuff takes so long right. to get into development queue. So like literally six months from now is right around the corner for major like big websites with a lot of red tape. But for mom and pops or not yep. necessarily mom and pops, smaller websites, six months is 
practically an eternity. Yeah. All right. So let's pick a winner. So as a reminder, we've got Kyle with COVID plus local, uh, Dalton with GMB, and Chris with Core Web Vitals. So who do we think did the best, uh, uh, left the best question, and who is worthy to uh, potentially get a new sticker for their laptop? I can be the reason people miss out on a sticker. Now that's a lot. Um, is there any way we can share the sticker amongst the three of them? Uh, uh, po potentially. I'm, I'm potentially open to that. I'm, I'm open to any and all eventualities as long as somebody finally picks the green sticker. <laughs> you should have asked that alongside the question. Uh, would you take the green sticker if you won? Right, um, yeah, I should have. <laughs> I have a blue I, one. I think, um, oh, nice. Um, yeah. So my, I vote for the Core Web Vitals question. Core think... Web Vitals. All right. All right. Chris Svenkara is our weekly winner of the best question and because chris uh is not somebody who enjoys being on twitter uh i will deliver that to him separately uh he's, he's too busy working out you're yeah people that would know chris would under would understand that and i'm sure <laughs> that if he i don't even know if he listens to pod to podcasts but i'm gonna make him listen to this one so he can hear that aside <laughs> comment from his former colleague <laughs> all right jeff let's close out the episode Helen, so this is our final question we ask all our um, guests. What words of advice would you give to a person that's just starting out in SEO? Um, I hear peach farming's a really good career. Might <laughs> want to um, no, I think my, my advice would be pay no heed to the likes of Twitter. Um, if you, like mm -hmm. me, only follow other SEOs in the industry, you get demoralized really quickly, especially when you're new to the industry. So, yes, they are doing some amazing things. Doesn't mean you're not amazing. Um, you're starting out in your career or maybe you've been in your career for 10 years. Um, don't compare yourself to other people. Just keep going with what you're doing and you will learn and you'll be doing amazing things in, in no time. But um, don't get demoralized by what you're seeing other people promoting on Twitter and LinkedIn because uh, otherwise you won't go into any career. Right. And that's actually good advice for people who've already are in SEO <laughs> and see all these amazing people doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. I get demoralized every damn day. Every time I sign into Twitter, I'm like, son of a bitch, they're already doing that. Or they're doing this thing that I'm like, I don't have time. Uh, and I, and Jeff and I, I feel like always talk about maybe these people, like maybe it's just built into their roles. I don't know how they do it, but there are people in the SEO industry that are literally, it seems like they're on Twitter tweeting their thoughts all day, every day. And I'm like, do you work? Like, yeah. when do you have time? Do you have a personal life? Do, like, I don't have time. I, I, not only that, I don't have enough thoughts to, yeah. put, to put out there. <laughs> so I, I am constantly impressed and demoralized and wanting to just go and curl up in the fetal position when I see some of the amazing people uh, that live on Twitter and SEO Twitter all day, every day. And Helen, I totally yeah. agree with that advice and I need to take it myself for sure. Um, all right, so that is this week's episode. Helen, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Uh, at home at the moment. That's all the only place I am. Uh, but They're online, not going to find um, you. <laughs> yeah, please don't turn off my house. That would be awesome. Um, I can't let you in. We're in lockdown. Um, I am usually found on Twitter, so at Helen Pollitt one. Um, there's a bunch of L's and T's in Pollitt, so good luck with spelling that one. Um, or you can try and hunt me down on uh, LinkedIn as well. And what's your company website if people want to work with you? <laughs> if you want to come work with me, nightmare. Um, or if you want to be a client, awesome. Um, arrowsup.co.uk is my URL. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. And for Helen, Helen gets to go into her weekend. She has uh, she has done her, her punishment, which is talking to us, and she gets to ride off into the sunset. Jeff and I, because we record on Fridays and release on Mondays, we've got a full day of uh, of work to do still. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you've listened this far, thank you uh, so much for listening. Like, subscribe. Uh, and like, subscribe. Uh, one quick review. Uh, administrative announcement. So this episode will post on 
uh, on Monday and it is Thanksgiving week. So we are not going to be recording a new episode uh, next week. So there's gonna be a bit of a delay. I know people are literally, uh, literally watching and refreshing their podcast apps every second to see when we post a new episode. So there is just gonna be a delay. Jeff and I need a little bit of a break. And oh, oh by the way, we're uh, gonna eat some quarantine turkey. So yes. Enjoy the episode on Monday because it's the only one you're going to get for another two weeks. And then we will be back uh, for a little while longer before the holidays. And we have two years of episodes you can go back and listen to. Well, we do have that. We do have that. And, yeah. and quite, quite honestly, uh, I would say last season, there's a bit of dated material because we tried to talk about the news every week. And that, yep. So yeah. just, and COVID. Disregard, disre yeah, disregard that, that part. Uh, yeah. But anyways, uh, if you're listening to this, have a great Thanksgiving week and we'll be back with you in a couple of weeks.